All right. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the uh, OAuth Top 10 Proactive Web Application Controls. Um, this essentially is a new um, paper put out by OWASP um, by Jim Manico and Jim Bird. And it's uh, similar to the OWASP Top 10, but it, it kind of focuses on what's more uh, the most important things and kind of puts it uh, in a little different um, priority. So uh, my name is Jason Montgomery. I'm an application um, security specialist. I work for Vericode. We do binary static analysis and dynamic analysis. Um, we basically try to find um, flaws in your code, essentially, through uh, your binaries, and then present you with some ideas on how to fix them. Um, like I said, this is the uh, OWASP Top 10 from 2013. Um, I assume everyone here is familiar with it. Anyone not familiar with OWASP or the OWASP Top 10, other than Ryan? <laughs> awesome. So uh, this is going to look at it more proactively. It's kind of the same things. It's kind of like the monster mitigations from CWE, um, but it's going to focus more on um, the web, uh, and it's going to put them in a little different order and kind of go a little more into specifics on how to implement them. Um, so this is what that list is, um, and we're going to kind of run through it. Now this talk is about three hours. I'm only going to try to do about 45 minutes worth of it. Um, so we won't get through all 10, and that's OK. Um, so I'll just kind of start at the beginning, because they're in order of most important down to least important. Um, so if you want to talk about what do you need to implement first at your organization, um, we try to start small. Um, and where do we get most bang for the buck? And then we move towards sort of more general programs and, and you know, how to really build up an application security program for your organization. So parameterized queries, this is hopefully not something we need to continue to talk about too much, so I'll probably burn through this pretty quick. Um, but this is the most dangerous thing on the internet still half the time, which is really unfortunate. Who, uh, who can tell me what this is? What's that? Yeah, and what is this used for, or what is this exploit? SQL injection, right. So this is like two very dangerous characters, which is hilarious when you think about it. Um, so let's look at this amazing attack. So we've got um, some, just some simple sort of pseudocode here. We've got a SQL update statement, SQL query. Um, and if the attacker sends tick semicolon, like we saw in the previous slide, that ends up in the variable, we truncate. And what's this update statement to at the end? So we just wiped out everything for uh, <laughs> all the users. So I think hopefully everyone's heard of this now. Uh, unfortunately, we still talk about it. It's still number one, or one of the most important things to do, uh, mainly because, well, we keep finding it. Anatomy of an attack, um, just to sort of see what we can do with it. Um, we here we have a simple login screen. Um, the server sort of crunches on that data. It's going to generate when we put in normal data, right? Username and password. It's going to generate the statements like username password from users, where username is Jmonty, password to password. Ends up going to the database and does that. It'll log you into the app, right? Pretty straightforward. Here's our attack tick or one equals one dash dash, right? So that's going to fill in the blank, comment out the rest of the statement, and it's going to probably log us in as the first user in the database, right? So um, then you can get more interesting. Um, if you don't limit the amount of text they can put in, they can start to exfiltrate data out of the database. Here we can start dumping XML data of all the users, and then we can get more complicated and then start dumping all the, the database schema, right? So you can actually extract the entire database structure and all the data within. So um, I assume you all are pretty familiar with that so far. So I'm not going to belabor these points. Um, the solution to these problems is simply parameterization. What does parameterization do for our SQL statements? Yes, Mick? It takes the uh, input text and makes it a literal string. Right. So it's going to make a little literal string, right? Um, so in this case, we have a question mark as the placeholder. Um, and depending on your type of prepared statement or parameterization you're doing, right, that's going to vary. So in some cases, it'll be a question mark. So in Java here, um, in Java Hibernate, right, we're going to set parameters this way, .NET. We're going to use um, a question mark for OLADB. We're going to use um, 
an at sign, right, if it's SQL Server, so on and so forth, PHP. Right, so there's lots of different ways to handle this in different languages is the point there. What happened to my slide deck? Oh, it crashed. Whoa, I don't think I've ever had PowerPoint crash. That was pretty cool. <laughs> All right. All right. So there's a couple references if you do want to take this back to your developers. How many people here are writing software regularly or is this more of a security crowd? So some people are writing software, who's doing security? work. Okay, so more of that. That's what I expected at this conference. Um, so what you want to take back to your developers is uh, more along the lines of these cheat sheets, right? So OWASP has nice cheat sheets that you can give to them as a reference that are going to help them work through this stuff. Um, so there's the query parameterization cheat sheet and secure coding practices cheat sheet. All right, so we got through that pretty quick. Uh, point two. So if we can, and the, the really nice thing about that one is if you can get your developers to fix that and you can kind of work uh, with them and create plans. It sort of helps you see how well you're going to be able to implement more. So if you can at minimum get um, that problem dealt with, it'll give you sort of a little bit of a forecast as how they're going to deal with more complicated things later. Um, so encoding. So this is cross-site scripting, um, session theft, XPath injection, XML, LDAP, uh, command injection, right? So encoding stops most injection attacks. That's really the takeaway point. So the thing about um, CWE that bothers me is that they say everything's an input validation problem. And I don't really see encoding as an input validation problem. I see that as an output uh, problem. So here's an anatomy of an attack. So here we have a script um, payload. And it's going to essentially inject into the DOM of a document, right? That's pretty obvious. So cross-site scripting is typically not viewed very badly by a lot of people. They tend to think it's, um, well, you can deface the page. It really only affects some users. Um, they don't really affect the, the level to which you can go with the data theft, um, keystroke logging, and pivoting or exploiting browsers, right? So it can go from just simple sort of defacement from, to that to network scanning and, and up uh, to more serious items. The big takeaway point for cross-site scripting is if we're talking about just web applications, is um, the context matters. So the encoding rules change. And this is the hardest part um, for most security people because they'll go back to their developers and they'll find a flaw with their scanner and they'll say, you need to encode the input. And so the next question is, well, I did. I encoded it all. And they're like, well, I still, find, I still see the problem. Uh, and the reason is, is because the, the context matters depending on where in the HTML DOM you are. So if they're embedding data in the wrong part of the DOM, you're going to end up with um, an exploit in the wrong place. So if we're in the HTML section, right, an HTML element has a tag. If they're embedding into the element, there are certain encoding rules there. If you're embedding in the attribute, there are a different set of encoding rules there. If you're in the cascading style sheet, you have different there. So we'll kind of go through some of these, and then again, if you're in XML or in LDAP, there's different rules for every different language. So here's a little chart that gives you a little uh, high-level view of this. Um, so this is the cross-site scripting defense by data type and context, meaning is it a string, is it an HTML fragment, um, or is it JSON data, right? So if we're in the HTML body and the data type is a string, you have to entity encode, right? If it's in an attribute, you have to do minimal attribute encoding. If it's in a get parameter, you have to do URL encoding. If it's an untrusted URL, you have to then do validation and encoding. See, typically you'll see URL encoding, but they didn't validate the URL, so they could send you off-site, right, and hijack you to take you somewhere else. Um, there's um, some cascading style, style sheet rules, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then at the, at the uh, JSON level, um, since that's pretty popular these days, you need to make sure you call json.parse um, in those situations, um, or they can break out of that as well. 
So let's look at some of these in more detail. I'll just kind of give you a really high level view. Um, but if we want to look at an HTML body context, right, that's the first one here, HTML body. So if we take variables and place data between these two elements, this is when we're going to start having issues. So here's the attack for an attribute. So when it goes in the attribute, if the attacker ends here and then embeds a new script tag, right, they can break out of the input and embed new JavaScript, right, and then they can do bad things. Get parameter. So here's a href. We're going to embed untrusted data into the query string parameter from either the URL or the database, right? The attack, you just need to close the quote and then close <laughs> close the quote, sorry. Um, and they can just embed an on click, right? So here we're just going to add a JavaScript event, which will start here, and then it'll do an on click which will trigger the JavaScript of our choosing in here. URL context. So this is if we have the whole thing wide open, right? All they have to do is put JavaScript colon. They don't even need an on-click at that point, right? <clears throat> That's in an href or a frame source, for instance. Here in a style, we have untrusted data being dropped into a width. And then there's the expression function in, in CSS that you can embed code into uh, that works sometimes. Untrusted data into JavaScript code. Now here at this point, things get really easy because I don't even usually have to uh, do too much to escape the data, right? I'm just embedding raw code right into your document. Um, so this is probably the most dangerous way to do it. <laughs> um, JSON parsing. Again, you use the json.parse, it'll help encode any of that, so that script won't, payload won't be executable. So as far as the cross-site scripting defense for DOM-based attacks, um, untrusted data should be treated as displayable text only. We don't want any code coming into the, the DOM that way. That's a bad architecture, that's a bad design. Um, some people want to sling all the stuff in however they want, and the, the web languages let you do that, but that's a bad way to go. Um, you need to JavaScript encode and delimit untrusted data as quoted strings, and use safe APIs. Like, if you're going to build a DOM in code, use document create element. These are going to automatically encode things. If you just like concatenate data together, just like you do with SQL injection, you're going to end up with problems. The create element will actually create the HTML element properly, and then embed the data uh, nicely right in there. Or element .set attribute um, in anchor text. Um, and this is true also of using any of the APIs in any uh, language, like um, .NET, if you're creating XML documents. You'll want to do a create um, element, create node, create attribute. Um, and that'll solve all your XML encoding issues, too. Avoid the use of HTML rendering methods, um, and avoid sending any untrust untrusted data to the JavaScript methods that have a code execution context like eval. There should be a space there. So eval, set timeout, on click, on blur. If you put untrusted data into those, they're writing JavaScript right away. Um, if you've written a lot of web code, these should be kind of one-on-one kind of things, but a lot of developers miss them um, because they're solving um, design problems this way and they don't really see the security implications. Um, encoding libraries. So there's a bunch of different libraries available depending on what language you're using. So Ruby on Rails, um, they have the reform project. Um, and uh, for Java.net and uh, all of these, OWASP has the OWASP encoding project. So there's a bunch of, of uh, elements there. ESAPI, that's the Enterprise Security API. This code API is created to do a lot of the encoding for you. From It's an OWASP project. That's a good resource. Microsoft developed the anti-XSS library. That one's really good. Um, it was good enough that they baked it into the framework in, in .NET 4. Um, they left out one portion. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, but that's that's the uh, if you're using an earlier version of .NET, you can go to the CodePlex site and integrate that into your system. But if you're .NET four and above, um, you just need to make sure the developers are aware of the anti-XSS calls. Uh, and then jQuery has um, the jQuery encoder if you're using that framework for JavaScript. The XSS prevention cheat sheet that OWASP is going to have. 
pretty much a lot of this information in there already with examples um, and then information about injection um, is the general sort of A1. This is the OWASP top 10 2013, number one. So if you look at the injection document, you're going to find a lot of that stuff. And then there's the encoder projects. Um, so these are um, your encoding libraries. And these are data encoding tools um, that essentially are going to handle more of the, uh, if you need to encode blocks of HTML. All right. Any questions on those two? Those I try to blow through those pretty quickly because most people are familiar with them. Um, again, the slides will be available. Um, a lot of the stuff is just a matter of looking up in each context to make sure you do the right thing. All right, so input validations, basic hygiene. Um, never rely on client-side validation. Um, the a client is in the attacker's control, right? There's nothing you can do safely there. Um, so we want to do it all server-side. So you can use it. Uh, it's nice to have because it helps create a nice user experience. But it's really helpful to, um, well, you absolutely have to do it on the server. You can't do it on the client. I trust it. You want to favor a whitelist validation over blacklists. Um, what's the difference between a whitelist and a blacklist? It is right here. But I mean, a little more detail maybe, perhaps. Uh, we want to focus on what is allowed, right? So um, it's harder to filter out everything. So if you have, um, if you allow everything in and just want to filter out some bad things, it's hard to know what the attacker might put in. There's lots of different encodings with UTF, uh, 8, 16, uh, and so on. So it's easier to just narrow it down and say only these 20 characters are probably more like 80 characters are allowed, um, and then we throw everything else out. For common data types, use a validation library. Apache Commons has some things. And then in MVC and .NET, they have model validators. This essentially means like they've already figured out how to validate emails. They've already figured out how to validate credit cards. You don't have to keep rewriting that code. Um, if you don't want to use one of these, um, it's helpful to write your own validators in, inside. Regular expressions. Some people, when confronted with the problem, think, I know, I'll use regular expressions. And now they have two problems. So how many people here have written regular expressions? Yeah. They're kind of a pain in the butt. Um, here's a good example of why. So if you want to validate an email address, um, it's hard to find guidance on how to do this properly, right? Do you use the RFC? I'm going to tell you no, um, because the RFC allows a lot more things. This is for email clients, not for input validation. So they're going to allow things like names and quotes, um, the angle brackets, before, you know, and, and ways to put it on multiple lines. They're going to go way out of scope for what you want to take in for your web form, right? If you're writing an email client, well, then you might want this, right? It depends on your use case. Um, so regular expressions get tricky, and so how does the developer pick? He Googles the first thing he finds, he copy and pastes it into his code, and then he runs, right? Um, after maybe testing it a few times. Um, I don't know that I find either of these particularly readable, um, un unless you spend a lot of time with these. Um, so I, I try to recommend developers just stay away from them except when they absolutely need them. So for email addresses, it's better to find a common library like the Apache Commons um, library or the model validators where someone has, has written these and they've, they've just banged, banged it on it a lot with a lot of test code. Um, that's the ideal uh, way to go. Um, and then use a fuzzer to prevent denial of service attacks. So Microsoft has the SDL tool. Um, their regex fuzzer, and essentially um, regular expe expressions can be very expensive, and if you write them poorly, um, you can end up iterating on code in a way that can essentially peg your server, CPU, and they can take your server down with a de denial of service. So you want to run it through the fuzzer tool, and they'll exercise it by throwing a bunch of data at it, and, and they see how it reacts, and then they'll give you a timing report so you can know, this one's dangerous, um, we need to rewrite it and, and rethink how that works. All right, validation. Um, so sometimes, unfortunately, you need to take HTML input. And this is where things get tricky because underneath this control that's sitting in your web browser is just a post, HTTP post, that has the HTML raw data in there. Um, so how do you know that's safe? So this control may limit what a, 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 a user can submit to the site. But an attacker can put a man-in-the-middle proxy in, and they can just hijack that request, and they can put in an attack. 
Um, so how do you verify um, that this does not have um, an attack payload in it, right? It's hard to do. So they've come up with a few approaches. Um, there's the OWASP sanitizer project. Um, and this has uh, gone un undergone an adversarial security review. So this is a good project to use because um, it has had a, a, a sort of pen test and code review on it that, that makes sure it's not going to be easily exploited. Um, and it allows simple, programmatic, positive policy configuration. What that means is you can say, for a particular type of tag, like if it's an anchor, I only want the um, elements allowed. I only want these type of um, bold tags are legal, italics tags are legal, links are legal, but that's it. We're not going to allow script blocks. We're not going to allow. And so what it does is it takes that DOM, that DOM fragment you pass in, it parses it, and it throw, it'll, it'll validate it against what's valid. And this was done, and it's, it's actively maintained by Mike Samuel on the Google AppSec team. So Google uses this um, sanitizer code, and they, he contributed it to uh, OWASP, which was really, really awesome. So it's super fast, and it also has low memory utilization because Google does, in fact, use it. So um, it's a good library to use from that standpoint. So this is hard to read, I, I, I am sure, for you guys. Um, but, it's, but here's a, a source output from a post. And um, the way you would write a policy um, is essentially you say, look, I am going to allow the anchor tag. I'm going to allow the HTTPS protocol. I'm going to allow href and A. And I'm going to require no follow links. And then I'm going to build that. And you pass that into their uh, policy.sanitize, and you give it the untrusted HTML document, and it'll just clean it up for you so you can trust that document. Um, so that's a nice, clean, concise way to set up a policy for that block of HTML, make sure it gets validated, and then you know, not worry about uh, cross-site scripting problems there. For .NET, unfortunately, uh, the world is not so great anymore. <laughs> um, there was the MS Web Protection Library. Um, they've given up on this. They used to have in their anti-XSS library, or the web protection library, um, a sanitizer. Well, they had a flaw in it once, and that got exploited. They fixed that, but then they've decided that they didn't want to continue development of it. Um, I'm not ex exactly clear why. The wasp anti sammynet hasn't been maintained for a while either. So um, you can use the HTML agility pack, but you're going to have to roll some of your own code with that. And if, if you take that approach um, on CodePlex, I think you can get there pretty quickly. But it's going to take a little extra work than it would have normally with the uh, anti-XSS sanitizer. The best solution, I think, for everyone is just to use Markdown. And let's not have HTML. Let's not have code flying around from the users. Let's use something that can represent stylistic changes um, and you can have a nice WYSIWYG editor that represents that, um, but you're not going to have all this code, really. The, the user should not be submitting code to a server to be hosted and then redisplayed on a page ever. Um, that's just dangerous. Uh, even with all the sanitization in the world, there seems to commonly be uh, paths around it found. Any question on that, those uh, solutions? Uh, file uploads. So this is a whole different sort of class of things you want to do with your app. And when you upload files, there are all kinds of interesting things that an attacker can do because they're sending you raw binary data potentially to your server. And then you're going to trust it in some way. You're going to host it. So let's say you have your users uploading images. But what if they upload an EXE and then browse to it? Or like, is the server going to run it on the server? Are they going to re-download it? Like, what's going to happen, right? You don't know. It depends on the server. It depends on how the developer coded it. Right? They could open the raw file and stream it down. Um, so it could open you up to cross-site scripting. It could open you up to hosting binaries or malware, whatever. I mean, it's just hard to say. So when you allow people to upload files, you want to do uh, a lot of sanitization and um, sanity checks on those files. You want to do upload verification. So make sure the file name is correct. Make sure the file validation, uh, that, that you know the extension matches, that um, you run it through an antivirus. Um, it's not going to catch everything, but it's going to catch some stuff. Um, you need to limit the amount of storage these files are allowed to take, how big the uploads can be. Um, 
if your server has special files and a user submits one of those, what happens with, if they upload a cross-domain XML or if they upload a client access policy XML or if they upload a web config or if they upload an any file or a, you know, a jar or a war, like who knows, right? So anything your server, and again, I would take the white list approach here, not the black list by trying to find and eliminate, but only accept a very narrow type of file into your system. Should be pretty common sense. Um, we want to do image upload verification. So that's the size image. And then it's really important to rewrite um, the image if you're doing image uploads. Why would it be important to rewrite the image with a, like maybe resizing it or maybe taking the image and rewriting it in a new way and then saving that and serving that up? Any ideas on why we like that? What's that? Could be. Yeah, if someone hit a message in there, you might screw that up. That's a good. I, I, yeah, that's a, not a bad idea. Yeah, any other thoughts? So the idea is if there was a payload in there, right, in the, in the image and somewhere in the metadata, in the binary itself, that was going to exploit like a flaw in a, a browser, right? Um, if you just open that image on the server and then re restream it out into, you know, maybe resize it by one pixel or convert it to a different format, you're going to eliminate a lot of the, any sort of payload that would have been in there through that method. Um, caveat there, if you had, if they targeted an exploit in your imagery writing library, well, so make sure you use an imagery writing library that's been well tested, but that's, that, that does narrow it down a little bit. Um, set your extensions to the valid extension. Don't let people provide the file name and the file extension, and don't let them provide the path. The path shouldn't be anywhere on the form at all. It should only be set by the server-side code. Um, and then make sure the content type is safe, right? So if they upload an EXE, that, that's not going to be the content type you expected. Um, you can also run through some decompression to see if it, it changes or not. Then you can you know, eliminate uh, types of compressed files that you may not be expecting. Um, any questions on that? It's a lot of things to do. Yeah. I was just wondering if you thought about like potential lawsuits if somebody uploads and copyrights it in the data, you take another species of code, like the image writing library, how would that be a liability? For rewriting their image that may have been. So if they have a copyright on it. They so they don't want you to modify it. Is that, is that the idea? Well, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it might be a. Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't honestly know. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a copyright lawyer, uh, or thankfully, I'm not one. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, fortunately, I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. I, it seems maybe a little ridiculous, but you never know with with some of these these cases. <laughs> They're kind of ridiculous. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, so here's the input validation cheat sheet at OWASP. Um, again, the slides will be available if you need the links. There's some other HTML sanitizers, you know, so if you want to take in a, a, a DOM, do you have a, okay. If you, want, if you need to take in an HTML document, um, you can use pure JavaScript, so it's a JavaScript implemented one to sanitize HTML. There's Python has Bleach, PHP has HTML Purifier, and the .NET HTML Agility Pack for .NET. Input validation tools. Again, just summarizing sort of the things we talked about earlier and providing links in the slides. That's really why this is here. All right, so to sum up the top three, those are the most important. If you can do these th three things, if you can control, maintain control over your inputs and maintain control over your outputs, you're doing a really good job. Um, that's going to solve, you know, I think a very large portion of any problems you have. So we want to do that through parameterization of queries, encoding data, and then validating all input. If you do anything, just do these. Like if you, want, if you need a place to start with your development teams or as a developer, I wouldn't worry about anything else after this. Um, uh, I would work on getting this correct. So CWE, the common weakness enumeration, has what they call monster mitigations. Um, and that is establishing the control over inputs and outputs. Uh, those are the, the top two of the five. Um, so there's really two things you want to ask yourself. And this is pretty 
um, a good way to look at any system. It doesn't matter if it's web, it doesn't matter if it's a web service, it doesn't matter if it's a Windows service or a WCF service, it doesn't matter, it, whatever, whatever the system is. So replace web application and database with anything. So you want to ask as the data comes in, should I consume this, right? That means input validation. So if I do a threat model, and I have those later, we probably won't get to it, um, but one of the first things I do when I do a threat model is I'll model the system, and then I'll look at every one of these ingress and egress points, and I'll say, should I consume? And then I ask here, should I emit? And if I do emit, should I encode? So consuming is input validation, emitting is output encoding. And it doesn't matter if this is SQL injection, it doesn't matter if this is LDAP, it doesn't matter if this is the HTML document back out, right? So if people ask me a lot of times, well, where do I encode my data? Do I take the user's data and encode it and then store it in the database? And it's like, well, no, you don't. This might end up in a PDF later and a website. Like, you don't know what the, you may know, but it may, you may need it later, and then you have to try to, like, throw all this HTML out of your database, which is not fun. So you should store it, but then whenever you render, whether it's back to the browser, whether you're sending it to a PDF, however, you need to make sure you encode at that point. So basically, at each trust boundary, you're going to make those decisions. So do I consume? Do I emit? Uh, and this could be multiple tiers, multiple data storages. It could be file systems. It doesn't matter. But this is basically those, those three points in a nutshell. If you can consume and emit, you encode, you input validate, you're good to go. Any questions on this? This is, the, I think, the best way to summarize the whole uh, injection problem, essentially. <clears throat> and it's not overly, overly complicated once you get to it um, and sort of think of it in these terms. All right. So well, let's talk about implementing appropriate access controls. So this is number four. So the first three were critical. Definitely do those. And then these are also important. Um, and we need to force all requests to go through a common access control check, right? Um, so this means no matter what, you want a common layer, right? You don't want to have to implement this access control check all over the place. You want to implement it in one place consistently um, and reuse the code to do that. We need to deny by default. You don't want to open allow, right? Because if someone forgets to put something in or you add a new page and you forget to check, then they can get to that document. So you want to deny by default. Avoid hard-coded policy-based access control checks in code. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, code to the activity, also that'll become clear in a minute um, what exactly we mean by that. And then um, server-side trusted data should drive access control. Don't trust the client, just like our other situation. I've seen a lot of Java apps rolled out that run on the client. And they'll do web service calls that do a role check. And I'll put Fiddler or Burp Proxy or Z Attack Proxy in the middle. I'll hijack the traffic. I'll add the administrator role in. And then suddenly the Java app opens up and I have full access to everything because they didn't do the policy check on the server. They did it in the client. Um, so yeah, you never want to do client side. Don't do it in JavaScript. I've seen that, unfortunately. Uh -huh. Don't do it in Silverlight controls. Don't do it in um, ActiveX controls. Only on the server. <laughs> so code to the activity. This is typically a role check. Um, you know, you want to see if they're in the role administrator or in the role viewer or report writer, right? Um, this, so a change in this, though, is going to require a policy uh, change and you typically if you hard code the word the role in the code and the role changes you now have to recode and touch all the files that use that right so that's not that's not efficient at all um, so you you're gonna miss places you're gonna typo places you have lots of risk associated with changing a role check sprinkled throughout all the code so we want to avoid role checks all over the place um, and if you do miss it again since most don't default deny, that means people are going to be allowed to get in. Also, if someone audits you and they're like, well, how, what's, the, what's the policy on this? You have to just show them all the code because it's really hard to 
I mean, you could try to summarize it, I guess, but the only real way to check it is to go read the code. That's not a great way to go either. Um, and I've seen, I've seen very complex apps with upwards of 60 roles, right? Um, Hard-coded all over the place. It's not pretty. So uh, there's a really cool project uh, by Apache called the Shiro, Apache Shiro project. And it's a Java security framework. And it specifically uh, centers around authentication and authorization. And it provides a really robust uh, capability access control, which is based on a capability and not a role, right? So, uh, and I'll show an example of this. This is going to be better than role-based, more robust, easy to modify, and you're going to have a policy basically in the config file um, that you can change very quickly without editing all your code. Uh, Shiro also has sensible and secure defaults for everything. So here's how the architecture looks for this thing. So Shiro has a security manager. It's got an authenticator, an authorizer, session manager. It does caching. There's plugins, right? If you want to use JDBC, LDAP, whatever, it's got that. Um, or you can use a custom realm. Um, it's got crypto built in uh, in a smart way to handle all your hashing properly and things like that. Um, and then you can basically interface with it with any framework, right? Because you can do these calls. Um, on another tier. So you can put this on one box, you can watch it, you can secure the you know, pants off of it. Because <laughs> um, that's your security manager, right? It's really important. So you put that on one tier and you share it, and so now you have sort of a centralized authentication framework to use across all your systems. So we don't want to code to the role, and here's why. If you code for the capability, you can say in this example, current user is permitted to lightsaber colon wield, right? That's not a role, that's a capability. And then you can go in the config file and put all the roles, right, that can do lightsaber wield. So if you need to revoke it from a particular set of roles or someone added a new Active Directory group that does it or whatever, you just edit the config file, you change the role, and then it ripples throughout the system because you coded to the capability. Um, and this will never change. The code is written to an activity, right? So you can do, in this case, lightsaber wield, use a lightsaber ring, use it wisely, right? If they're not permitted, if the user is not permitted to wield a lightsaber, then they get the sorry message. Uh, how about, and you can get more specific by colon delimiting each of these items. So in this case, is the user permitted to drive a Winnebago with the license plate Eagle 5, right? So you can get down to the direct object in code, and, and in many cases, that will be dynamic, right? You'll know which object you want access to dynamically, and you'll be able to look up dynamically which users have access to that object, right? And you can get very fine-grained um, capability, right? That's like having the car key for that Winnebago, right? Yeah. In reality, though, you wouldn't be coding to protect that area as opposed to that particular area. You're coding specific zip codes, which ports them out to the home, and change the world. Fair enough, yeah. Yes, you have found a flaw. <laughs> yep, that's correct. Any questions on this? This is pretty handy, and I think it's a really smart way, and it's something I've only learned about in the last year, and I was like, wow, why haven't I ever done this before? <laughs> um, it's way better than role-based. Um, it's super handy. So if, if you don't have Shiro, I would recommend architecting your systems this way instead. So that, and then you know, you can just have the log file and say, well, here's all the capabilities, and here's all the roles in those capabilities, and I'm done. I've audited the system. Uh, it's a good question. Um, there's there's probably some ways to tie it in. I don't really know if they're since I haven't tried it, and this is a little, you know, in the last year I haven't really worked with coding in with one of those products, I can't really think if, if there would be any hiccups with trying to do that. Um, but that's worth exploring, because that, that would be ideal, right? Um, so I don't know if you can put capabilities in there and then map, put roles in roles, but some of your roles are capabilities, and some of your other roles are roles. And, and if, as long as you structured it properly, and you guys were disciplined, I think you could might be able to get away with it, um, but I haven't tried it, so I, I, I'm not sure. All right, uh, access control for your browser, content security policy, CSP. 
essentially, we should stop writing inline JavaScript, right? If you stop writing inline JavaScript, you can add content security policy response headers to your browser, and then you can validate. So if someone tries to inject a script, it'll get rejected, access denied, right? So it's authorization for your browser for remote scripts. You can define your policy for the site regarding the loading of that content, and now you can prevent someone from injecting scripts. And then if they try to inject raw JavaScript, well, you're not allowed to have inline JavaScript, so they won't run. <clears throat> so to get rid of XSS, I mean, this is just, right, repeat after me. <laughs> I will not write inline JavaScript. Um, so yeah, we don't want unsafe inline. Let's get rid of it, Make all your, move all your JavaScript external, document that, put that in your CSP policy, be done with it. Uh, that's going to solve a lot of cross-site scripting problems too. It's going to add a nice another other layer of protection. Um, that could be pretty powerful if people would use it. Um, we did a report recently, and um, no one seems to be doing this quite properly. Um, on a lot of sites we surveyed the headers on and looked at their policies, there were a lot of problems with, sadly, the CSP implementation. Um, but it's pretty, it can be pretty powerful. So OWASP has an access control cheat sheet, authorized after you authenticate always, of course. Um, OWASP has a PHP role-based ac authentication control project. And then I would look to Apache Shira, though, if you uh, either if you can use it and if you can't use it as so sort of architecture guidelines for building your own system in a more sort of uh, activity-driven way. Uh, any questions on that section? No. Okay. I stab establish identity and authentication controls. Oh yeah, so let's talk about how passwords should be stored. How should passwords be stored? Does anyone know the answer to this question these days? <laughs> oh my god, wouldn't that be awesome? I think that's that's actually the best answer, yeah. Um, so usually you'll hear like, you know, just hash it, or add a salt and hash it. It's like, well, that used to work, but we're running into problems now. So with the GPU cracking rig, right, for 3500 bucks in your house, or rent some AWS time on their uh, high-performance computing cluster for two Tesla GPUs or whatever, um, you can essentially uh, do about 183 billion hash checks, what, per day, per hour? Oh, per second, right? 183 billion hash checks per second. Yeah, so hashing is really not going to help you, even with assault at that point. So uh, typically you'd go to the Rocky dump, which has 32 million passwords, the Sony dump, which has about 1 million passwords. You run those against and through the GPU cracking rig. Um, anyone who, you know, you only have to find one user who had their password similar to one of those ones in the dump, right? Um, you don't have to bust every account. You just need one or two, and then you, you get in. Um, so really, like, um, the basic hash is dead is really what this is saying. So password guidance. So we want to not limit character set. Like, I don't know why sites keep limiting character sets now. The banks consistently do this. Um, and I don't know if their old systems can't store bytes, probably. Why are they storing the passwords in the mainframe? I don't know. Um, but okay. Um, I feel like there's another solution to that problem. <laughs> then just like, oh, we can't do it. Um, and don't forget to set a reasonable minimum length either. So someone used uh, PBKDF2. Uh, uh, this is an assessment I did in, in one of my previous jobs. And they, they, they use password-based key derivation function version 2, which essentially will hash the hash the hash the hash, you know, however many iterations you want. Um, but the problem is, is they used a pin, four digits. So I have a little code. You can't really see it here, but it took me nine minutes to break it. Um, <laughs> So you can use the right things and still, you know, if the key space is not good enough, it doesn't matter. So guidance two, use a cryptographically strong salt, a unique salt per credential, 32 or 64 salt size is dependent on the algorithm you're using, but um, 
And don't depend on salt hiding, splitting, obscuring, you know, uh, that's not, your protection doesn't come from hiding the salt. It comes from using a correct algorithm. So the idea here is your protected password is gonna be a combination of your salt and a hash of your salt plus cred and the algorithm you wanna use. So it's kind of a pseudo uh, way of looking at it. And then you wanna impose an infeasibility verification on the attacker, and this is essentially, you wanna make it really expensive. So their GPU cracker cannot just blow through 183 million really quick, right? You want them to sit there and churn on it. So instead of 183, however many per second, um, you wanna really slow them down. So there's a couple techniques you can take. We can leverage an adaptive one-way hash function, which I'll talk about in a minute, or we can leverage the key function. So 3A will be the adaptive one-way hash function. This is like password-based key derivation function if you need FIP certification um, or enterprise support. A lot of products have it. .NET Framework has a library that does this. Um, or you want to use S-Crypt or B-Crypt. Um, and essentially you want to use S-Crypt when you want to resist any hardware and accelerated attacks but you don't really care about support on S-Crypt. And then bcrypt if um, S-Crypt or pbkdf2 is not supported or available. And this is how this one works. So you're gonna take the salt, the credential, and a number of iterations, right? So in this case, we have like a million. You're gonna run that through pbkdf and you combine it with the salt and that's your protected password. So essentially we're adding a work factor, right? We're making them work a lot harder. So instead of blowing through one hash, like one way hash function, we're gonna make them do 100,000 hashes to get one check, which greatly increases the time it takes. So we wanna, however, you wanna configure to run as slow as possible without affecting the user's experience, right? You don't want them to log in and wait 10 seconds, that would be bad and there's other reasons for that. Increasing the need for extra hardware over the budget, right? So you start pinning all your cores on your C uh, CPU, you've got a denial of service problem, um, you need to buy more hardware, that's not a great situation either. You also need to limit your upper password length because a, you know, a 50 gig password, 50 meg password, 10 meg, I mean, you, you get the idea. You, know, you only need so many characters in a password, probably no more than 20 or 30. Um, 50 if you want to be generous, you know. Um. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> If you, the other option is to use a keyed function. So say you don't have the luxury of slowing down because you have millions of logins per second, right? Your Facebook, your Twitter, um, that's not gonna be, that's just not gonna work, right? You have this giant user base, massive scale. You can't use these because 10 concurrent runs can pin a high powered CPU. Right, and if you have millions of logins, that's a lot of servers you need to service that many people logging in. Even if you just offload your login to one box or one cluster of boxes. So you need to impose a difficult verification on the attacker, but it has to be fast. So the other option is to use an HMAC, right? These are still fast, but you have a protection of a key on that. So if someone steals your database, um, they still have to go through um, beating traditional crypto instead of like just a hash function. Uh, and that's gonna be more ex uh, expensive. Also, anytime you're doing crypto, you wanna isolate this to a hardware security module if possible. Otherwise, it's really hard to guarantee any sort of security with crypto in general. Um, here's how this sort of look, works in pseudocode. You're gonna do the uh, HMAC SHA-256 in this example. You're gonna pass in the key to that function, the salt concatenated with credential, and then you're gonna add the salt to that again and store that value. Yeah. Yep, you're right. You're right. I, I didn't mean script. <laughs> so, yeah, good eye. So, yeah, I should be as script with a Y. Yeah, I think. And if you're going to handle this key function, you can use a single site weight HMAC key. Um, you don't need one for every row or every user. You got to protect that key just like, you know, uh, any crypto key. It's very important. You want to store it outside the credential store, not in the same database as everything else. Get it away from that database. So if someone rips it off, they don't have the key. HSM, again, is ideal. 
generate that key using a cryptographically strong pseudo random data, right? Use a good random number generator. Um, don't worry about the output block size. That's not really the critical importance at this point. Um, and, and that allow performance um, with, if you have a lot of logins. Um, any questions on that? Um, yeah, um, but I think there's other ways to deal with that, and we'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, I mean, that is a, a good common way to, to handle that problem. And, and it, for some people, I think it might be the best solution, too. It just depends. I think there are 15 or 15 about 10 to 15. 10 to 15? Okay. Should I stop now, or a couple uh, more slides? I'll go a couple more minutes. Couple, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, I'll just blow through this section. We'll be good. And plus, I the slide deck is online, um, and it has... It's like a couple hundred sl slides, so there's a lot of other info if you want to look at into it. All right, so uh, how many uh, people's policy would this password fit in? Most. <laughs> and it's a terrible password, right? Um, so password policy is not going to help us either. Um, and so really it's time for multi-factor authentication, right? Um, I, that's really what's going to... Everyone else is moving to it, even some sort of cheap variety of it. Um, a really, really easy way to get this up and running really quickly is with um, time-based one-time passwords. It computes a one-time password from a shared secret key in the current time. Um, and then you can go and download a free app from Google, Microsoft, Duo. You key in this, or, you, or they give you this to take a picture of which puts the secret key, shared key for you in there. And then it's essentially two-factor auth like your RSA token, only you can use your phone and an app on that phone. Um, so this is uh, pretty, uh, it's basically free, it's easy to implement, and you don't need to go out and buy a ton of like products and stuff to make two-factor happen. Um, super powerful, easy to implement. I would look into TOTP um, if you want to move to two-factor uh, on a budget. Google right now has, la has launched, and this is sort of real early, but just to give you an idea of some of the other things that people are working on to get rid of passwords, um, it's a universal second factor. You can buy these on Amazon now for, I think, like 15 bucks. Um, Chrome will have awareness of it, so you can just pop it into a USB socket. Chrome will essentially use it as your HSM, essentially. So you can have your hardware, your, your, your password stored and protected in a piece of hardware that you have to have with you, so it's like a second factor. Um, I've been uh, meaning to order one of these and play with it, but I haven't had time yet. Um, all right, so I think I'll just draw it there. That's probably a good place. Um, awesome. Any questions on um, this point? Cool. Well, thanks, uh, and ha have a good rest of the day, and enjoy your, uh, I think there's, is there an open, uh, what's next? Uh, 5.30 in the 5.30 in Union, so yeah, okay, great, thanks.